We believe that before the Lord Jesus returns, he is going to do a mighty and a significant work in the lives of his people, the elect. He is going to prepare them for his return. He is going to not only be a way to prepare a place for them, but he's going to, in the process, be preparing them for that place. And it seems as though the 20th century charismatic movement has had its share, if not more than its share, of various delusions and uh, misguided ideas that they have gotten off into. And one of the things that has particularly fascinated and maybe overly fascinated the charismatic movement is the realm of miracles. There's just something about the realm of miracles that uh, posits an extreme fascination in the minds of uh, charismatic people. When you look back on the healing revivals, the Pentecostal movement, the Latter Rain movement, the charismatic movement, uh, what can you call it today? Some people are calling it the third wave. You've got the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement. Now this is charismatic hyphen evangelical movement uh, where you don't have to speak in tongues, you don't have to be baptized in the spirit. The emphasis is more on miracles and casting out demons than on speaking in tongues as some type of evidence of a spiritual change. Other people could call what's going on signs and wonders. Other people have maybe not with so much tongue-in-cheek have called it the pre-ecumenical movement where all types of different people are gathering together under this, this um, well, it's some type of unity banner. We're going we're gonna to unify over something. And so many times it seems like it's in the area of the miraculous. And if the miraculous, if the production personally of large numbers of miracles is really where it is, then why hasn't the church over all of these years through these various miraculous demonstrations, matured more than she has? Why is it that we're having to go through the same things or we never learn the old lessons if the area and realm of the miracles will really do it as a lot of people are so excited about? I think that God is trying to work. He, he's trying to, he is trying to do a work in the lives of his people, but... Surely we're not naive enough not to realize that Satan is also going to be working in the land in the last days. When you go back into Matthew chapter 2, surely this, is not, this cannot just be ascribed uh, to the uh, overly jealous, sinful heart of a human monarch when Herod, upon hearing of the birth of one of whom it is said he will be the king of the Jews, desires and plans and plots the murder of all the children under the age two, two, under the age of two in Bethlehem. Surely that cannot just be ascribed to the jealousy of the heart of a heathen monarch. Surely Satan himself is the instigator of that behind the scenes. Now you don't really see him on the scenes there, you just see normal human reactions and operations taking place. And we know how people are very much being caught up in the realm of the miraculous today. I, <clears throat> I have read, I think just today as a matter of fact, of a man, a so-called prophet in a church in another place who is very well known and very well liked and uh, very much appreciated by the people under his ministry there and in various parts of the United States and I suppose the world and they ascribe to him a lot of authority and power, and a lot of that is on the basis of the miraculous in his life. And you find out that whenever these angels began to appear to him, back whenever he was a boy, calling him to ministry, calling him to a prophet's ministry and all of this, this may not be who you're thinking of, so it's somebody out there anyway. Well, he fell away into drunkenness and thievery and robbing and he would steal things and was a professional thief and a gambler and a drunkard for a number of years. And then he finally, you know, got religion again, came back to God and his ministry, this, this prediction by the angel of a prophet's ministry has so-called, or in the process, so-called of being fulfilled. Now, that's really stretching it a whole lot to think that an angel talked to a man, said you're going to be a prophet, and he turned into a professional gambler and thief. 
for 20 years. And then he got his eyes open, just about died and all of this, and then finally turned around. And Well, what I was going to say is he, for the last 15 years, has, has between five and ten visions or dreams per night. Now, that's 15 years running. That's 365 nights out of the year, five to ten. Now, people are going to follow that. You better believe people are going to follow that. Five to ten visions or dreams per night, 15 years running now. And yet, what happened back there for those 20 years when he was a professional gambler and thief and a drunkard and an illiterate bum? And now he's the Lord's anointed end-time prophet, he and a whole company of other prophets. And we're going to be talking about this prophetic company and realm before we're through with all of these studies we are involved in. What we are going to be looking at tonight is a continuation of where we left off last time, the latter rain movement, its history. We were looking at how it spread. It seems as though people ought to, if they're going to uh, dive off the deep end and really become involved in a certain area around, they ought to uh, check up on it a little bit and find out where this is coming from and who are some of the people involved and what are some of the issues and controversies that are to be seen here. I had been giving you earlier the actual history of this outpouring in February of 1948 in Canada, and we were then talking about how it began to spread. And I have a whole lot of information. I don't know whether you're going to be able to write all of this down quickly enough, but I want to painstakingly paint a picture of a spider's web of how all of the things that we're seeing today have various interconnections with either things directly coming out of the latter rain movement or in some way indirectly connected to it. And before we're through, you'll probably be surprised at how pervasive this is. The Assemblies of God denomination, if I can just add this as an aside for right now, is really, well, this year and last year, really taking the initiative in beginning to publish materials. They have a commission, which they call the Assemblies of God Commission on Doctrinal Purity, kind of like the Pharisees in the, the New Testament, where you check everything out that claims to be Pentecostal and you find out whether or not it's got biblical backing. And, of course, sometimes they're right in their discernment and sometimes they're wrong. They didn't like the baptism in Jesus' name issue back in the teens of this century, so they missed God there. They didn't like uh, some things in the latter rain movement. Well, they missed God in some areas there, and they didn't miss God in some other areas. But there's a whole lot going on in Reconstructionism, this um, post-millennial Calvinistic uh, theonomy-type movement that's non-charismatic, uh, there's this other kingdom now type theology, which is going to have a big, I think, international conference this fall down at the big uh, headquarters church in Atlanta, Georgia, and people from all over are going to be there. And they've got various views that are directly related, that are directly related to the latter rain movement. And then there are just, there are just innumerable various splinter people and groups that have been affected by all of this. So watch as we go along. I said in three different ways the latter rain movement began to spread out of one little small setting, the Sharon Orphanage and Bible School in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. First of all was the Sharon Star, which was a regular monthly publication that was sent out from this non-denominational autonomous independent group. George Halton, his brother Ern, Milford Kirkpatrick, and some others were the leaders here in this school and church in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. And I've read some, of, some excerpts from the Sharon Star, which was sent all over Canada and in places and parts of the United States, detailing some of the outpourings they had experienced in February and some of the later ones as well. That's one way that word of mouth uh, began to take this far and wide and people became very interested in what was going on. Now, I've just described it in general terms to you, and I've said some of the things that characterize it. Anti-denominational views, uh, belief in the restoration of all things, the restoration of the fivefold ministry office, offices, restoration of the spiritual gifts, laying on of hands, communicating both gifts and ministries by the laying on of hands, and, and there, are other, there are other things that they are known for. Of course, chief among them being the John 14, 12, Romans 8 issue, the greater works manifestation of the sons of God. 
Tonight I'd like to come to a second way in which this movement began to spread. And those were through meetings that were held right there on their so-called grounds, campgrounds there in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. I'm just going to mention a couple of these. Meetings held there that attracted widespread attention and attendance. Meetings held there in North Battleford. So far, notice we're talking about things that originate there. The Sharon Stars, a publication sent out from the group. Meetings held there in residence. If you want to come, you've got to come from wherever you are to this place, and you can witness some of the outpourings. From March the 30th through April the 4th in 1948, they held what they call their annual Feast of Pentecost Gathering. Feast of Pentecost Gathering. We're going to be studying some more about feasts later on because the study of Old Testament feast is one of the hallmarks noted among the latter rain people. They're very big on their use of types and shadows of allegorizing just about anything and everything in the Old Testament if they can make it fit some scheme of doctrine or theology, which gives, one, which gives an individual no objective way, no controls on the text, no controls on the interpretation of the text of Scripture. Getting ahead of the story, talking about one of the manifested son's leaders, Bill Britton, who has since died, but he was one of the earliest ones, denied the, the literal historical narrative of Genesis 2. The Garden of Eden, Eden, he would like to say, he, Bill Britton, I've read a lot of Britton's works, and I happen to like a lot of what Britton has to say. He's a real sly writer. Before you know it, he's smiling the whole time he's hitting you below the belt. He's that type of writer. He's just real sly and smiling, kind of an old grandfatherly figure, and while he's smiling, he's cutting your throat at the same time. I, I told you about their view in uh, theology last time, transcendence, rapture, what is up to the person in China is down to the United States, man, and so forth. Britain was the one who mocked all that. Oh, ha, 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 he would say. So what are you going to do, pull the people to the center of the earth? You know, he's smiling the whole time he's cutting your theological throat. In, in certain areas, now he had some very good doctrines in some other areas, but here in this particular area on Genesis chapter 2, he would kind of smile and say, do we really think that God intended through his prophet Moses for us to believe that the Garden of Eden was some piece of, um, what did he call it, heavenly real estate? That was his joke word, I think. Heavenly real estate? Well, no, Eden is a spiritual condition that the matured sons of God are by the Spirit caught up into, you see. They'll go back to the Old Testament and allegorize anything and everything and just explain everything away, trying to find a spiritual type there, and all of it's focused on one thing, the grand, final, eternal, ultimate purpose of God, and that's the manifestation of his matured sons. They say everything from the beginning of time is pointing toward that, and there is some warrant of truth to all of that. There's no question about that. But what, but what they do with the truth then is they say, well, let's try to find as much support as we can for what we just claimed in the Bible. But God never wants us to go and twist and mishandle Scripture, denying its historicity to prove some spiritual point from it. If you're going to do anything, say, I believe it's a historical account, now let me apply something spiritually from it. You'd be a lot safer, a lot more biblical than that. I mean, Paul takes things from what the wilderness experience of the Israelites, the crossing of the Red Sea, the pillar of the cloud and fire and, and, so, and the water that gushed out of the rock. And he's not denying the literal historicity of all of that, but he's drawing some spiritual analogies from it. That rock that followed them was Christ. Well, he didn't mean Christ was literally a rock, but he was the one who was supplying their needs. He was the God who was in the cloudy pillar and the pillar of fire. He was the one there. But what about the rock that Moses literally smote with the rod? That wasn't Jesus. That was a rock. Paul isn't denying that. So the Feast of, of Pentecost, they're going to go back and find all types of fantastic um, allegories from that. And then they're going to take it a step further and say, well, there's another feast that's not been fulfilled yet, and that's the feast that we are to be participating in today. Well, you know, Charismatics and Pentecostals, if you know anything, I'm going to show you another tie-in right here. They're just innumerable, almost. Pentecostal churches and groups are really pretty well known for holding their Charismatic Feasts of Pentecost, Feasts of Passover, Feasts of Tabernacles. 
Why, you're just not reading the charismatic magazines if you haven't been tempted to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem with some charismatic leader and celebrate the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. Some of that goes on over there, and it's really a holy place and a holy way to celebrate it if you join one of these little bands that goes over of, you know, Americanized uh, Pentecostal charismatic people. You go over to Israel and join one of these little celebrations. You can do it right in Jerusalem. And they'll flash back pictures, and you end up with pictures in their charismatic newsletters and their charismatic bulletins and magazines and journals that we went to Jerusalem and celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. I remember back during, this was in the 70s, back during the big height of the shepherdship bondage covering controversy that there was going to be a big international conference on the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. Of course, the place of preference for meeting would be the upper room, right? If you could locate it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that sanctify your international meeting on the Holy Spirit? Find the upper room. Well, they found the upper room and met in it. Well, some of the shepherdship people were invited to speak like Derek Prince, and some people were very opposed to that, like Catherine Kuhlman, who also was one of the keynote speakers there, and she said, I'm not going. She refused to go because Derek Prince was going to be there. But see, that was a special thing. I'm showing you these, these ties back into if we can get over there to Israel because Israel's apostate, and we don't believe anything about her or them anyway, and now we are the spiritual Israel. The church is the true Israel of God, Galatians 6. We're going to go over there and celebrate Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, have an international conference on the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So I think a lot of this goes back to some of these early meetings right here, a Feast of Pentecost, an annual Feast of Pentecost gathering. Here's what Kurt Patrick had to say. I quote, I think this was published in the Sharon Star. We never saw, this is the March to April of 48 meeting, we never saw such a variety of cars and license plates before from many provinces in Canada and from so many states across the border. People drove for miles. Now, that's not very long after February of 48, whenever all this began. And all it took was a couple of months later at their annual Feast of Pentecost gathering, and Kirkpatrick writes, people drove for miles. We never saw so many cars and license plates from provinces in Canada and from so many states across the border. Then here's another meeting from July the 7th through the 18th, the same year, 1948, they had a huge, this would be the largest meeting of that year, a huge Sharon camp meeting that attracted thousands and thousands of people. Took up all of the central part of the month of July, July 7th through the 18th, 1948. So that's just a few examples of a second way by which this movement spread, meetings that were held there on location. And then a third way, and this, this would be summing up and concluding also what I wanted to say about how the movement spread. We'll spend the rest of our time here tonight. It spread through meetings that were held elsewhere, either under the direct or indirect influence of the North Battleford ministers. So we've got the Sharon Star meetings on location in Saskatchewan and meetings held elsewhere. You see, those who either heard about the meetings from people who had been to North Battleford meetings or people who had heard about them through the Sharon Star or people who had actually traveled from the United States or other parts of Canada to the North Battleford meetings, well, what would they do? They're going to go back home and desire the same message to be brought to them. And so that's exactly what began to happen. One of the earliest things took place in late July of 1948. This is right after the big Sharon camp meeting. And a husband and wife team who had been there to the Sharon camp meeting in July took this message back to a church in Hibbing, Minnesota, encouraged the pastor there, a Pentecostal work, that this was what they needed. The pastor then telephoned George Halton and Milford Kirkpatrick, asking them to come, which they did. There was an ensuing revival in Hibbing, Minnesota, at this church, which lasted for a number of weeks, and all types of miracles and signs and wonders were done here. 
That was one of the earliest attempts. A husband and wife took the message back to Hibbing. As soon as they got back, they're ready to start it up there. They telephone Halton and Kirk Patrick, extend an invitation to them to come to Minnesota and minister. They accept, they do, and signs and wonders are the result. In October of 1948, the North Battleford ministers took the message to Edmonton, Alberta. October of 48, they took the message to Edmonton, Alberta. Now, what is especially significant about this meeting is here a very important figure from the healing movement, which was going on around the same time. This was the time of Branham and Co. and Allen and Roberts. A very important figure from the healing movement by the name of Joseph Matson Bowes, if that's the way you pronounce his last hyphenated name. He's a very well-known figure at that time. You can find him easily in the Pentecostal books. B-O-Z-E, Joseph Matson Bowes, was present here at the Edmonton meeting. See, he's present at a meeting that's not at North Battleford. He was present here at the October 48 Edmonton, Alberta meeting. He took the message back to his home church. He was the leader of a church in Chicago. And some sort of a stronghold was established there. Now, you would have to know something about Mass and Bows. If you don't have David Edwin Harrell's All Things Are Possible book, which gives um, an historian's view, he's a professor at the University of Alabama and Birmingham, of the Pentecostal charismatic view, uh, movement in this century, you really need to have it because it'll give you the background of a lot of these people that we're talking about, or at least some of these people we have reference to. And Joseph Madsen Bose was one of these, and his name will come up again before we're through tonight. The next month, November of 1948, a meeting was held in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this was especially significant for getting this message, the latter rain manifested son's message, into the United States. This would have to be, in my mind's eye, one of the, if not the most important meeting for getting the movement across the border. November 1948 in Vancouver, B.C. Thousands came to this meeting. One person there that perhaps didn't appear to be especially significant turned out to be more than significant. It was a woman, the founder and pastor of an Assemblies of God church in Detroit, Michigan. And her name was Mrs. Myrtle Beale, B-E-A-L-L, an Assemblies of God church planter and pastor in Detroit, Michigan. She had traveled several thousand miles by car, obviously from Michigan to British Columbia, to be at this meeting. She took the message to heart, what she saw, she believed, miracles were done, prophecy was in uh, evident manifestation, the laying on of hands, falling out in the spirit, ministries being prophesied, gifts being transferred by the laying on of hands, she was featured later in this year, I think uh, in December of 48, in the Sharon Star. The Sharon Star was a very important publication for spreading this message, as you can see by my continual reference to it. And in this feature of her, she wrote, everything we saw in the meetings was scriptural and beautiful. We left the meeting, this is the Vancouver, B.C. meeting, with a new touch of God upon our souls in ministry. We certainly feel transformed by the power of God. Never in our lives had we ever felt the power of God as we do now, and we feel we are carrying something back to our assembly we never had before. Well, the name of her assembly was Bethesda Missionary Temple. It is still in Detroit today, by the way, and it's still a rather important work in charismatic circles. Bethesda Missionary Temple became the stronghold in the early years of the latter rain movement in the united states okay so that's how important myrtle beale's attendance at the vancouver bc meeting was she had uh she had come i believe from a roman catholic background if i remember some of mrs beale's background she only died in 79 she was born in the 1800s, 1896, I think, and died in 1979. 
She'd come from a Roman Catholic background, didn't like that, fell away from the Roman Catholic Church, ended up getting saved, spirit-filled, uh, began preaching to people in her neighborhood and got so many people interested in the message of the New Testament that she founded a church. And what happened was the church began to grow. She was a pastor of it. It began to grow and grow and grow. All of this is happening in 1947. They decide, she and the leaders of their group in Detroit decide to build a new 3,000 seat uh, auditorium to seat all the people for the big congregation uh, in uh, Detroit, 1947. Then, before the building is constructed, meanwhile, in 1948, she has contact with this new movement, the latter rain manifested sons of God movement. Then what happens in 1949, she is going to dedicate the building. I don't know why all religious people think you've got to dedicate something made out of sticks and stones. I guess that's like conferences and seminars, some type of carryover from the world. But they were going to have their big dedication ceremony, and for the dedication ceremony, they asked the North Battleford ministers to come down, which, of course, they did. These men began to travel quite a bit the first year or 18 months uh, from 1948, from February of 48 onward. For about 18 months, they were really in the limelight leading this movement. And it became the stronghold. Let me mention several things about it that will also tie in later on. At the same time, she has come back to her church, has told the people in the church what she's learned and heard. We're going to leave. She was kicked out of the Assemblies of God, and she was leaving anyway because that's one of the sins that the manifested sons of God people were trying to overcome, that sin of sectarianism or denominationalism. So she had to resign from the Assemblies of God denomination. She was going to be put out anyway. She told them, we're going to leave that, the Assemblies of God type of Pentecostalism. And we're going in favor of this, which we believe is a restoration of New Testament Christianity. All right, at the same time that's happening, in East Providence, Rhode Island, a man by the name of Ivan Q. Spencer is meeting. You ever heard of Ivan Q. Spencer? He's a pretty big name earlier in this century in Pentecostal circles. Spencer is meeting at a Pentecostal prayer fellowship meeting in Rhode Island. A latecomer to the meeting there in Rhode Island has just come from Myrtle Beals Church in Detroit. He comes in and shares with some of the brethren there, these Pentecostal brethren gathered together for a time of prayer and fellowship, what he has just seen and witnessed at Bethesda Missionary Temple in Detroit. Uh, this so interests Ivan Spencer that he forgets the meeting there, gets in his car, and drives to Detroit. He's ushered into the church right away to the basement. Meetings are going on. He watches signs, wonders, prophecies being given and coming to pass and all of this. And Ivan Q. Spencer, his son Carlton, become very interested in this, very wrapped up in this. And they, Ivan Q., the father, he was the founder of Elam Bible Institute over near Rochester, New York, which is still there today, which has been a very significant um, like a conveyor belt that has been feeding various people and ideas and teachers into the charismatic movement, one of them being Bob Mumford of Shepherdship fame. We'll talk about Bob Mumford later on. You're going to be amazed at all the connections between all of these various things. All right, and something else that's happening with Mrs. Beale is she writes a letter to Stanley Frodsham. Now, Frodsham comes from Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal Evangel, Smith Wigglesworth book, Fame. He's the one who wrote the book, Smith Wigglesworth, Apostle of Faith, and gives a history of him. He has a daughter, Faith Campbell, who wrote a book about him, Stanley Frodsham, called Stanley Frodsham, Prophet with a Pen. Stanley Frodsham is probably best known in charismatic circles for writing the book published by Assemblies of God Publishing House, 1445 Boonville Avenue in Springfield, Missouri, entitled With Signs Following. Now, all charismatics have heard of that, With Signs Following by Stanley Frodsham. Now, he had been, I think, for about 27 years, the editor of the leading normal, regular, non-technical publication of the Assemblies of God denomination, still being published today, by the way, called the Pentecostal Evangel. He had been there almost three decades. Stanley Frodsham was one of the early founding fathers of the Assemblies of God denomination. 
Mrs. Beal writes him a letter and asks him, won't you come up here? Now, the Assemblies of God was cutting this message off in a hurry. Won't you? And he is the editor of the leading voice of the Assemblies of God denomination. Won't you come up here and just investigate and witness for yourself what's going on? Frotchum goes up there, sees it all. I could read some quotes from him. I think I may later on. Is very impressed by it and decides this is it. So he leaves the Assemblies of God. And that really caused a falling out among Assemblies of God ministers when someone of the stature, you know, three decades standing, of the stature of Stanley Frodsham left the Assemblies of God denomination. All this is going on around 1948 and early 1949, and most of it, notice, in the connection with Bethesda Missionary Temple. All right, let me just give you, this is going to be very quick and brief. These aren't as important as what I've just said about Mrs. Beale. Some other leaders and locations for early influences here, primarily in this country. This is just a list of them. First of all, there was Thomas Wyatt, W-Y-A-T-T. -T. Thomas Wyatt, he had a church in Portland, Oregon, the Wings of Healing Temple. For the continuation. Thomas Wyatt, he had a church in Portland, Oregon, the Wings of Healing Temple. He brought the Sharon ministers in on February the 20th, 1949, and 900 fellow ministers attended. 900 Pentecostal charismatic ministers attended. Wings of Healing Temple in Portland, Oregon, Thomas Wyatt. Another leader, very early leader, was Paul Grubb, G-R-U-B-B. -B. He had a church, Faith Temple, in Memphis, Tennessee. Mr. Grubb is still alive, still living in Memphis. Lawrence McKinney had a work in Cleveland, Christian Faith Temple. Fred Poole had a work in Philadelphia. These were big latter rain centers, okay? That's what I'm trying to give you. They were centers for latter rain movement and doctrine. Some of them have continued to be that down to this day. Fred Poole, P-O-O-L-E in Philadelphia. Charles Green in Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, William Marshall in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Omar Johnson had a work in St. Louis. The church's name was Glad Tidings Temple. I'm going to say something about this particular place, Glad Tidings Temple. Now, I want to pause again for a moment, and I'm going to be getting ahead of the story. Take a look at the names of all of your churches that you have down there. Anything stand out as temple? <laughs> Obviously. You notice that all of these are called temple? Bethesda Missionary Temple. You've got Faith Temple, Wings of Healing Temple, this temple, that temple. And in light of what I've already said about their preoccupation with allegories from the Old Testament and trying to turn... Uh, various feasts into something immensely significant for us right now, Feast of Pentecost. Kind of the leading historical doctrinal book that came out of the Latter Rain movement was a book by George Warnock entitled Feast of Tabernacles. And that's like the um, uh, doctrinal manifesto, as it were, of the Latter Rain Manifested Sons of God movement, the Feast of Tabernacles by George Warnock. These people are very wrapped up in typology and allegorizing in the Old Testament. And they also have some rather unscriptural, if we believe what Paul said in Romans chapter 11, some unscriptural views concerning Israel. I find this interesting that we don't find a single reference to a local church being called a temple. In the New Testament. Now, in a spiritual sense, we are stones and make up a living temple, but 
the actual group, the gathering together, the Lord even gave it a name himself. And he said it would be my assembly. And that's what the book of Acts calls it. That's what Paul, he never says, greet the pastors in the temple there. In the temple? Well, there's only one temple. That was a Jewish temple. And there is as much difference between the Jewish Old Testament and Christianity today as there is between daylight and darkness. And people want to make us kind of the, the, the um, New Testament Israel and try to bring all of these things over for us today that we're supposed to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles as Christians. They haven't understood. This is a Gentile message here, not a Jewish one. But you see, if you don't have the New Testament belief that God has temporarily set aside Israel only to yet deal with her again in the future and restore her fully, then you hate to see all that stuff in the Old Testament just go for naught, wasted on a rebellious people under the Old Covenant. So what do you do? You turn yourself into spiritual Israel so you can apply all of that to yourself. I was listening to a tape by a minister, a leading pastor of a church in Indiana. I don't mind mentioning where it is, and I'll read the quote to you. I have a quote. I could dig it out now, but I'll just get ahead of the story and tell you part of it. He's preaching away about, we've got to go back to the Old Testament, find types and shadows and allegories, great end time, outpouring, prophets, prophetic ministry, all this type of stuff we've been hearing a lot about. And he said, this was a real significant statement. We were supposed to take it that way. Whenever he said it to me, I just said, so what? But the statement was, I don't know if any of you realize it, but 1990 is the year of the Jewish Jubilee. So I'm sitting out there saying, well, so what? Where do, where do we find Paul or the Christians saying that this, the year in which we live now, AD 64, this corresponds to the Jewish year of Jubilee. So what? If, if this is the Jewish year of Jubilee, then so was 1890 and 1790 and 1690 and the halfway mark as well, 1940 and 1840 and 1740. So what? Someone thinks this is very significant. This is a Jewish year of Jubilee. So what? That's not, that's not New Testament doctrine or practice. Why are people getting all caught up in wanting to celebrate this feast and celebrate that one and reminding us that this is a year of Jubilee? They're trying to bring all of that over by typology. I would call it allegorizing the Old Testament and trying to make it somehow apply to us in a real mystical way that you can't get your hands on and can't get your fingers on. Now, that seemed like it was a real significant statement in a big church in Indiana whenever some pastor said, this is the year of Jubilee. She's like, wow, I didn't even know that. He said, I doubt most of you know this. You need to take it seriously. And I'm sitting out there, so what? I know I didn't know it was the year of Jubilee. And now I don't really know any more than I knew before I heard this tape, except now it's the year of Jubilee, but I don't know anything else about it. Because what does that mean to me as a Christian? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What does he think it means? That's my problem. doesn't mean anything to me. doesn't mean anything according to the New Testament. What does he think that means? What does he really think that means? Feast of Pentecost, Feast of... Oh, my... Well, anyway, I got off on that by saying, look at the names of these churches here. Temple, 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 temple. And I don't find First Assembly Temple in Corinth or the Temple of God in Athens. There was a temple, it was a pagan one. There was only one temple that was so-called Orthodox, and that was the one in Jerusalem, and according to, it was a Jewish one, and according to Matthew 24, it already kind of had a little bit of a, divine from Jesus Christ curse upon it. He said, you won't find one stone standing on top of another one. And I don't think he was talking about the church. I think he was talking about the Jewish temple there. Well, glad tidings temple. That's a contradiction of phrases joined together. Glad tidings is another way of saying the gospel. The gospel temple? What are you, what, what are you saying? The new bondage? The new bond? You're putting together the New Testament with the old. That's like talking about a Christian Sabbath. That's a contradiction of words there. You can't, there's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Paul said all, that, all those handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, God took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2. And he mentions, he mentions Sabbath in particular. Sabbath, there's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Sabbath, that's Old Testament. <laughs> That was bondage and law for them. 
They couldn't do anything on the Sabbath, couldn't even light a fire on the Sabbath, couldn't even pick up sticks on that day. You had to make sure you had enough food from the day before so you wouldn't have to work on the Sabbath day. And that's a good old carryover that came right into the Christian church through some of the Puritan ideals of colonial America. Oh, they were really big on this Christian Sabbath. No work, no pleasure. I mean, no, it's the, the Sabbath day, you know, you go to the Sabbath meeting on the Sabbath day, which was not Saturday, it was Sunday. They knew en enough about the New Testament to know that Christians didn't meet on Saturdays like uh, the Seventh-day Adventists do. They meet on Sundays like the New Testament did on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, when they met together to break bread. They knew enough about that, but yet they turned the day into a day of darkness and a day of bondage and a day of gloominess. Rather than being a day of joy and victory and happiness and celebration, it was a day of can'ts and couldn'ts. You can't and you couldn't do anything. You couldn't even have a, a pleasureful thought because that might tend toward carnality on the Lord's day. And they were big, you know, no dice, no cards. Well, you probably should be manipulating those things anyway. But you could play them the rest of the week, but you can't play them on the Sabbath day. You made one day more holy than another. Now, that's not New Testament doctrine. That's Old Testament doctrine. You made one day more holy than another. And now you're showing that Jewish, that Old Testament bondage and anti-New Testament freedom and church and gospel spirit. You're manifesting that by calling your church, not what Jesus called it, the church or the assembly, but the temple. Any number of charismatic works are called such and such tabernacle or such and such temple. Some groups, I, I even know of one that was known as such and such tabernacle, first of all, and then they got really thinking spiritually about that and thought, well, the tabernacle was just a temporary kind of ugly um, carried about expression of the house of God back in wilderness days. And all we're doing is confessing we're still living in the wilderness Solomon built a glorious temple, so they changed the name of their church from such and such tabernacle, charismatic, to such and such temple. And then I know of another one that never changed their name. <laughs> They're still called such and such tabernacle. Well, wait till you hear some names of some books before we're through with all this. It's a whole spider's web all mixed together. All right, Glad Tidings Temple. We'll just have to say, apologize for them that they were so mixed up in their bondage ideas that you don't mix the New Testament, with the Old in this way. That's like calling it a Christian Sabbath. This was a very frequent watering hole, I would call it, for latter rain peoples and causes. Just to give you one example, a November meeting at Glad Tidings Temple, this was pastored by Omar Johnson, a November meeting in 1950 that attracted hundreds and hundreds of people to it had these following ministers as the featured speakers. See if you recognize any of these names. Myrtle Beale, Stanley Frodsham, Fred Poole, Paul Grubb, Ivan Spencer, Thomas Wyatt, Joseph Matson Bose. Those are names I've just given you. It was a frequent watering hole for latter rain causes and peoples. And one other speaker here that I'll just throw in at the bottom was Harry Hodge from Beaumont, Texas. Now, the reason I mention him, I have one particular reason, show you how widespread the latter rain movement was just at this time, a couple of years after it began. Harry Hodge from Beaumont, Texas, had a relationship with over 80, that's 80, 80 latter rain churches just in the southern and southeastern part of the United States. He was associated with this many in 1949. Shows you how many churches were influenced by that, just like BAM almost overnight. That's just in the southern and southeastern part of the United States. He was kind of like a leader that was in association with 80 southern latter rain churches. Now, another man who, actually, who missed the earliest... Um, latter rain moves both the one in Saskatchewan as well as the one in Detroit but who came to be one of the crucial leaders one of the most prolific writers and defenders of the latter rain manifested sons of God doctrine was Bill Britton and I want to say just a few things about Britton although we'll talk about him his doctrines in a lot more detail later on we're just giving you historical background right now Bill Britton 
Now, Bill Britton goes back early, but he doesn't go back as early as some of these other people. He goes back to 1949. Now, there is a book about Britain. Uh, I've mentioned it before. Here's what it looks like, Prophet on Wheels, which is very fascinating. If you want an insider's look at the whole latter rain movement, its doctrine, someone who is favorable to it and who was one of the most um, ardent defenders of the movement down to the day that he died, this would be a book worth having, Prophet on Wheels by Bill Britton, really written through the eyes of his children. Now, Britton was... I'm not going to tell you much, just how Britain connects to the latter rain movement's beginnings. Britain was an Assemblies of God minister in Springfield, Missouri. Now, Springfield, Missouri just happens to be the international headquarters for the Assemblies of God denomination. They were going to have, in the spring of 1949, just try to keep in mind some of the dates, this would be about a year after the movement began up in North Battleford. In the spring of 1949, the Assemblies of God denomination was having a huge national Sunday school conference there in Springfield. And ministers were invited, of course, from all over the United States. Now, picking up with that as the background, let me just read directly from Britain's book. Some brought news of a great move of the Spirit in Canada and Detroit, Michigan. See, if you didn't know the background that I've given you already, this wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if you're reading Bill Britton's book. Some brought news of a great move of the Spirit in Canada and Detroit, Michigan. The end-time revival has started, they said. When Daddy heard the report, he began searching for some facts. One of the well-known speakers in the conference had been to Detroit. Now, he's talking about Myrtle Beale's church there. He mentions Beale by name later in the book, page 86, I think. Daddy found him in a restaurant eating a late-night snack after service one night. Three other preachers were with him. Daddy joined them, and laying his Bible on the table, he said, I hear there is a new thing. And remember, there's a big emphasis on, I will do a new thing, Isaiah 43, 19. I hear there is a new thing going on and revival breaking out. Show it to me in the Bible. Where is it in the Scriptures? Now, one thing about Britain, you have to understand, you'd know this if you read some of his material, is he was kind of a maverick. If he felt that someone could show him something from the Word of God, he was going to believe it. And if it meant he had to leave whatever, he would leave whatever. He gave up homes, he gave up jobs, he gave up pastorates, he gave up licensing, ordination by the Assemblies of God. He has that in his favor, that if he felt that you could show him something from the Word, and Assemblies of God denomination wouldn't approve of it, then he's staying with the word. He's going to leave the Assemblies of God. He had that type of a real maverick-type spirit, which in that regard is a biblical spirit. If someone can show it to you from the word, then you're going to follow the word, and whatever you have to leave, you just have to leave. So he said, show it to me in the Bible. Where is it in the Scriptures? And this business that he's talking about is this this latter rain movement, a great outpouring, not just a Pentecostal outpouring, a great outpouring where the sons of God are going to be matured and do all the works of Jesus. He had not seen that in Pentecostal circles before. So he said, show it to me in the Bible. Where is it in the scriptures? And there it was. Romans, Ephesians, Timothy, Deuteronomy, all through the Bible. Scripture after scripture, testifying to the truths of the one body of Christ and the sin of denominationalism, the ministry of apostles and prophets in the church today. See, this thing that some people in Indiana are really getting into, we're going to see the prophets and apostles, this isn't something new that's just begun, that the 1990s are just going to begin. This was something going on way back 40 years ago. People don't know their Pentecostal history very well. The very ones who are reading all about it don't know it very well. They think this is a real modern thing going on. This has its roots 40 years ago. The ministry of apostles and prophets in the church today, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the members of the church, imparted by the laying on of hands with prophecy. It was there. Why hadn't they seen it before? It was time for revival. The supernatural manifestations of the Spirit were in abundance. Now let me go back here. I can only speculate as to what uh, Britain has reference to. Remember, he's at a restaurant having a late-night snack after a service after the Sunday school convention in 
Springfield. He meets some other people who have been to the Detroit meeting, and he challenges them, show me this end-time revival manifest. Show me that from the Bible. And he said, and there it was. Romans, I would assume he means Romans 8. Ephesians, probably chapter 4, verses 11 and following. Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Timothy got something. Deuteronomy, well, I could guess, but I really don't know exactly what he means by that. I could hypothesize. And all through the Bible, Scripture after Scripture testifying to these various truths. Later, he is um, in Florida. He's going to relocate in another place in Florida. But before he does, this is May of 1950, he decides to go back to Missouri and make some final arrangements there. And on the way back, they stopped over in Memphis. All right, now what's in Memphis? This is Paul Grubb's church, Faith Temple in Memphis. We stopped over in Memphis, Tennessee, where we discovered that Pastor Paul Grubb was having a latter rain convention at Faith Temple. The speaker was Brother Fred Poole. Now, he's from the group up in Philadelphia. Uh, the speaker was Brother Fred Poole of Philadelphia. We had never seen a latter rain service, so we stayed for a few days to be in the meeting. Now, here's what happens. See, Britton probably gives the best account of how he came into it all. It started, let's say, in the spring of 48. He doesn't hear about it until the spring of 49 at a Sunday school, an Assemblies of God Sunday school conference in Springfield. People have been to Detroit and have come there. He's heard about it. He doesn't hear much more about it for a year. Now we're to the spring of 1950. And as he confesses here, he had never seen a latter rain service, never been in on it before. But he's been thinking about these things for the past 12 months. Uh, he tells some other things I can uh, skip over. After lunch, Daddy returned to the afternoon service at Faith Temple, troubled in his spirit about what he had heard. What he had heard was that he had met a former district superintendent of the Southern Missouri Assemblies of God Diocese. <laughs> I'm adding in my final word there. That's all it is, just like a Roman Catholic hierarchy, who had warned him, watch these latter rain people. The district superintendent was there to watch, spy out, you know, the land. But he warned Britain whenever he saw him because he was Britain's former district superintendent whenever Britain still lived in Missouri. Watch out for these latter rain people. So Britain doesn't really know what to believe. He doesn't know, are these people right or district superintendent right or so what? The so-called new order of the latter rain. He didn't want to get into anything that was in error. So slipping into the service late, he took a seat in the back and began to listen very closely. Suddenly, from all over the audience, prophecies began to come directed at someone who was about to make a decision. The word was specific, and the Lord did everything but call Daddy's name. He knew the Lord was calling him to follow the Spirit of God and to be delivered from the organizational bondage that was upon his heart. He deeply loved the assemblies and everything they stood for, but he was being called to something far greater in God's eternal purpose in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to talk about how uh, finally he did go up front and they prayed for his deliverance from the, I quote, spirit of denominationalism, end of quote, which there's no question about it, that's often a spirit. He's released from that, and yet he doesn't know what the future holds. So he ends up the next day, the last day he'll be at Memphis, in the meeting, and he has a prophecy called out over him uh, Fred Poole, I believe, is the one who calls him up front and lays hands on him, calls him into the ministry. This was just widespread among latter rain movement people. And, I, I, and we're going to talk about that later. That's one of the problems where inevitably you're going to have extreme excesses there whenever men are calling other men into the ministry. Now, they'll use a verse on you, 1 Timothy 4, and Timothy had some things said, uh, over him by the laying on of the hands of the elders of the presbytery. So it's not as though that could never happen, but I think that you have, you have the possibility, well, I don't think, I know of all types of excesses here, all types of excesses where ministry just lay hands on just people they don't even know because they've got the spirit of the anointing, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of I've got to give someone a word here. And how, how do you know whether that's, and people got called into all types of ministries. Britain's ministry was that of an evangelist. And Britain was pretty much anything but an evangelist. 
uh, as the book is entitled A Prophet on Wheels. People more saw Bill Britton as a prophet than they did because if you read the book, you'll see he had some rather remarkable and tremendous signs and gifts that followed his ministry. So here's another figure I'm throwing on, Bill Britton. And then let me just throw one other figure on who also was associated with the Latter Rain Movement, and that is a man by the name of Paul Cain. Yes, in the latest edition of the Grace City Report, which is a monthly newspaper prepared by Kansas City Fellowship in Kansas City, Missouri, they have had so many requests for information on Kansas City Fellowship, on Bob Jones, on Paul Cain, on Mike Bickle, on John Wimber, on the Vineyard Movement. They've had so many requests for information. They finally recently decided to publish what they call a special across the top here, prophetic edition, a special prophetic edition, which is uh, very interesting. I've got about a dozen extra copies if anybody would like one. Later in this, they give various um, portraits of various ministers, of course, one of those being Paul Cain, and reading from the fourth column on page 13, they're talking about Paul Cain's past ministry and his present ministry, and the author of the article writes, Paul is now 60 years old and has been a part of the latter rain movement. Now they go on to say more. There's a lot before that and a lot after that. That's the only thing I need right there. In other words, there's nothing to hide. They're not ashamed or anything. That's a direct quotation. That is what you call evidence for saying that Paul Cain is a latter rain movement person. And there's no question about it, in my mind anyway, that he's been influenced either by it directly or indirectly by some of his doctrines. One of his doctrines is he denies a rapture of the church, which was one of the strongest doctrines of Bill Britton and George Warnock. They denied any rapture, any pre-tribulational rapture of the church. And Paul Cain does the same thing. If you've heard, and I'm sure a lot of you have, some of his tapes, wherever he tries to make fun of the standard view of John 14, verses 1 to 3, he just poo-poos the idea, mocks the idea that Jesus went away to build something. He spiritualizes it all. Well, do you think that Jesus really has a hammer and a saw and a carpenter's apron and he's up in heaven building something for us? You know, that passage, I go away, I'm going to build, you know, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there may you be also, John 14, 1 to 3. He poo-poos that whole idea. Say, so, well, what do they say about that? It does say that he's building. Well, he's not, it's not anything he's building. He's building something in us because we're his temple and he wants to live in us. So what he's building is a higher spiritual habitation in us. So, so what? So that we can live in us? He did say that he's going to come back and get us and, and so that we can be wherever he is. Well, they say that's not to be taken literally, like in the physical sense, like he's going to be coming down from heaven and he's going to come down and stop at the clouds. See, they don't like that view at all. They don't believe that. They say that's a delusion. That's a heresy. That's a pessimistic, non-overcomers, escapist attitude toward the difficulties that God has called the church to face during the tribulation period. If you try to escape the tribulation, it shows that you're, a, in current um, contemporary language, a wimp. You're a spiritual wimp. If you're afraid of the tribulation, these guys aren't afraid. We're going through it. And you know what? I always tell them, yeah, that's exactly right. You are going through it. You made a good confession. You're going to get what you confess there. But some of us are confessing we're not going to go through that. Let me read it again. Paul is now 60 years old and has been a part of the latter rain movement. Now, it goes on to mention the healing movement and other things to show you. They're not talking about the healing movement or the charismatic movement. Those two things are mentioned in the same sentence uh, specifically. That Paul Cain has been a part of the latter rain movement. Well, I already knew that from his doctrines. See, I knew that. I didn't have a quote. I didn't have a piece of evidence here where he or someone who would know him could tell me forthrightly, Paul Cain is a manifested son's latter rain type person. I didn't have that, but I believe that anyway. And you ought to be able to believe something if you can hear the teachings of people like George Warnock in Feast of Tabernacles and Bill Britton in Prophet on Wheels and Another Look at the Rapture and Arise, Sons of God, and all these type of things that they deny certain biblical truths like the rapture and espouse a, a misinterpretation of others like the manifestation of the sons of God. And if Paul Cain teaches those same things, which he does, 
that somebody's being influenced by somebody. Either A's getting it from B or B from A or both got it from a demon. <laughs> I mean, we're either going to say you borrowed, it's, a, it's a, just a human sharing, which is okay. I've gotten a whole lot of things I know from other people. And if they can be supported by the word, that's fine. It doesn't matter how you got them. As, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, whatever word you've heard, you commit that to other faithful men and ministers, and they can minister it to others. So you get the word of God from other men. But whenever it's something like this, it's an unscriptural doctrine, you can't be getting that from the Bible. Now, you can get it from your false views about, but you don't get that from the word. That doesn't come from the Bible. You either got that from somebody else and or you or they got it from a deluding, deceiving spirit. Well, anyway, Grace City Report, special prophetic edition, the fall of 1989. Paul, now 60, has been a part of the latter rain movement. Now, let me bring you up to date. That's all kind of past tense, although Paul Cain is kind of like a bridge figure. He goes back to those days, and he is still around with us today. By the way, Paul Cain's mother just died uh, last month, if you didn't know about that or hadn't heard it, which is really a sign to a lot of the people out there. Because remember, the prophecy was that your mother will live, your mother will still be around whenever I introduce you to a new breed of people. And now that he's been introduced to a new breed of people, that would be Indiana-type people, Wimber people, kind of all combine a big conglomerate there, then it would set his mother free to die, which she did. She knows she promptly died after all these things got fulfilled. So it's a real sign to a lot of people out there. This message will be continued on the following.